great. Appreciate the faithfulness. We're going to sing number 404 as we get started tonight. Number 404. This is called the Solid Rock. We'll sing the first, the second, and the last verse. Sing it out with me. Jesus Christ, our salvation, our solid rock. Sing it with me. Sing it together. Number five, zero four. Oh, he touched me, and 
message to that song. It's a beautiful message. Men's Prayer Breakfast, we got coming up on Saturday, 8.30 a.m. And a big fellowship there for the men. The church, of course, church wide dedication comes at 10 a.m. Right after that, approximately. And uh, the Lord's Supper service will be next Sunday night right here in this um, building. And then after the service, we have one piece of business. We're going to have a quick business meeting right after the service. Um, if you want to be a part of the church business, try to stick around for that. That'll be next week, October the 2nd, right after the service. October the 4th, Ladies Fellowship at 6 p.m. That's a Tuesday night. And then I told you about October the 14th, Bob Evans Farm Festival activity. We'll be having a bus. The shuttle goes right into that if you'd like to use that. And uh, everybody is welcome to attend. October the 16th, our fall festival. We'll follow the morning service. Great time for the kid kids, the young people. And October the 30th through November the 2nd will be our missions conference. Lots more information about that coming up later. Let's read our missions or our support letter for this uh, evening is the Women's Care Center. And this came from August, August 2022. She writes, Dear Decatur, thank you for supporting Women's Care Center with your recent donation because of your giving. Women's, Women's Care Center continues to provide free, excellent medical services to women experiencing an unplanned pregnancy. Your support is helping change lives and is making a difference right here in the Middle Ohio Valley. Several times throughout our workday, nurses and staff gather to pray for patients who are scheduled to come to the center for their appointment. Our prayer is that hearts are touched and lives are changed by the authentic love of God and those their deepest needs in that moment. I am grateful and humble that God uses you and me to reach out to those who need them. What an honor it is to be part of something that matters. Our prayers and support go deeper than we realize. God is truly doing amazing things here at the center. Be sure to mark your calendars for October 16th, this year's Walk for Life. It'll be an exciting event as we plan to have over 220 walkers ra raising funds for Women's Care Center. Fundraising events like this make it possible for the center to exist so far this year. Uh, Women's Care Center has already served over 371 patients. We have served their many needs by providing pregnancy tests, ultrasounds, ST testing, baby necessities, and godly counsel. All these services are provided at no cost to our patients to help them make life-affirming choices and to ensure that they have access to the positive health care that they need. May God bless you for your dedication to his ministry. He always takes what we give and blesses it beyond measure. Thanks for being a part of life change in our community. Same him and Angie Bramer, Director of Development there at Women's Care Center. So keep them in your prayers. Um, certainly throughout the week if you get a chance to do that. Let's sing one more here, 294, 294, a song of devotion, set my soul on fire. A little longer our theme about prayer, set my soul on fire. We're going to sing all three verses tonight.
sing last night. Amen. Here we go. Set my soul apart. Starting to bring back memories. Apologize sometimes I get them out of the way when I try to leave things. But uh, anyways, why don't we do a couple of choruses? Want to do a couple of choruses? Let's do 73. We did that one once and I really enjoyed that one. 73, worshiping God for creation. Now art worthy to receive our praise. 73, sing it with me one time. 73. Oh, mm-hmm. 
uh, humility is fine. Does everybody understand what I'm saying? When we see Jesus lift up his hands, at his, his head to pray, that's wonderful. And that's great. And different people have, you know, different ways to like it. Some people like to kneel down to pray. I, my knees are bad. I feel like I have like 60 year old knees or something. You know, not that that's old or anything. But uh, I, I just, I, I, if I kneel down to pray, I, I last a few minutes. You know, I just, then I gotta get, I generally I like to walk. I like to pace and pray is what I like to do. And so everybody has kind of their own way of doing it. Jesus had his way because he wanted to look up and face up to God. And so that's great. Bowing your head, I think, is great as well. There's nothing wrong with that. So he says, Jesus says, Father, the hours come, glorify thy son, that thy son also may glorify thee, as thou hast given him power over all flesh, that he should give eternal life to as many as thou hast given him. So right off the bat here, Jesus jumps in with something that he mentioned in his, you know, he said, uh, after this manner, therefore pray ye the Lord's Prayer, telling us how to pray some of the things to pray for. He mentioned uh, that all glory needs to go to God. So that's what I wrote down for number one. All of our prayers need to be to the end of the glory of God the Father. That's number one. All of our prayers need to be to the end of the glory of God. So here the time has come. Jesus has always been, and he's always had as his main purpose on this earth, his decease which he should accomplish at Jerusalem. And the responsibility of being the Passover lamb, the entire world is dependent upon. So the time is ready. He says, now take me into my glorified body. Glorify thou me that I might point all glory back to you. And that reminds us that all of our prayers should be to that end. That God the Father is receiving glory from the things which we pray. Obviously, we should never pray for things to take place that will bring attention to us, that will make a lot of people like us and praise us, things that would make us popular or comfortable. We should never pray for things like that. And Jesus knows that the glorification here as being crucified and then being raised to his glorified body, that he might go into the upper room and stand with the disciples and show them his hands and his feet that had the holes still that bore the scars of the, the tangle with the devil that day on Calvary, that that glory would all go to God the Father. And he's in our example, in our prayer here, he's praying about subjects, about things, about God doing things that will bring about the glory of God anyway. That is our example. Jesus knowing being him being crucified and then being raised to his glorified body. This is, of course, a huge step toward the great day that's still in the future today, the day when every knee shall bow and every tongue shall confess that Jesus Christ is Lord. And what's the rest of the verse saying, Philippians 2? To the glory of God the Father. That is the reason why that event will take place. And listen, if you ever feel like, I better, I better check this prayer. I better make sure that my prayer right now is a biblical prayer. I better make sure that I'm not asking amiss. This is one of the checks that you can do. Make sure that if God just precisely answered your prayer, precisely the way in which you prayed it, that everybody would watch that answer. Everybody that would see what happened in that answer would immediately say, wow, we have an awesome God. Wow, you know a God that is an amazing God, and you have a God who is wonderful. Now, that's a biblical prayer. But if a prayer that is answered would make people say, wow, that preacher sure is great. Wow, I, I love this service. Man, that Benny Hinn, man, he must be awesome, right? Hey, that person up there who's, is just, he's a great person. He's got talent, or he's got charisma, or he's got power with God, and it's something that I would envy him for, like we talked about this morning. That is obviously not a biblical prayer if it's something that lifts us up. So we see tonight, first off, Jesus goes right out of the gate. He goes after the glory of God through the things that he is discussing with God. And if Jesus was all about his own glory, would he really continue to cross to die in great shame and reproach? Would he help out the Sanhedrin as he did? If you remember the story, the high priest brought him in, and he just says, I adjure thee by God that thou tell us whether thou be the Christ, the Son of God. Listen, Jesus could have just kept his mouth shut if he wanted to, but he goes ahead and kind of helps them out because they're still struggling to get people together who could say the same, you know, a similar story that doesn't contradict one another, and now it's, you know, it's not valid testimony anymore, right? So he just says, listen, hereafter ye shall see the Son of Man sitting on the right hand of power and coming in the clouds of heaven. And so we see that Jesus didn't have his own glory on his to-do list. He had the glory of God the Father on his to-do list. And that is one of the first steps to praying in the Spirit and praying biblical prayers. Just as Jesus said in the model prayer, after this manner, therefore pray ye, thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory. Our glory goes to God. So we need to learn to make our prayers, set them up intentionally to where they are all about the end of the glory of God, not ourselves. Number two, 
We see Jesus here talked about what was going on in his life. So I put down number two, talk about the main things going on in your life. When you pray, tell God about the things that are happening around you. There shouldn't be any elephants in the room, so to speak, when we talk to God. We talk to God about the most important and significant things happening. Jesus is praying and he says, you know, the time has come at long last. We're finally here, Father. We've made it. There's been a lot of planning, a lot of effort put forth to this point. And there's been, there's not going to be anything else big like this ever again. So Jesus doesn't just leave that un unaddressed before God. He comes to God and he talks about that instead of talking about whatever else could be, you know, the, the, the first few subjects that he gets to. He talks about what the important stuff is that's going on. What I'm saying is the things that are happening in your life. Let's say you're, you know, you're about to get married. You're considering selling your house or buying a different house. Um, you're, you're going to college. You're considering getting a divorce. You're considering, um, you, maybe you find out that you just got pregnant. Or maybe there's bills in your house that you're, 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 your house is about to get foreclosed on. Things like that happening in your life, you should talk to God about those things. Share with God how happy you are, how they make you feel, how sad you are. I'm just saying, he's our Heavenly Father. You know, if you found out that you're going to be having a baby, what is one of your first thoughts? We got to, how are we going to tell mom, mom and dad, right? How are we going to tell our parents? Do you, want, do you want me to skip over this part? You can be honest with me. Okay, that's fine. <laughs> uh, we covered some of this in, in, a, in a apple tree this afternoon. So I was going to say, hey, is that okay if I tell that story tonight? We're going to tell a different story. But uh, maybe you've seen on, online now they have all these, they have like these confetti tubes. You know what I'm talking about? Or the, the smoke bombs or whatever. It's just like, we're going we're gonna to go over to their house and we're going to turn around and, you know, when they're not looking, hey, look over here. We're having that gender right there, you know, or something like that. And they always end up shooting themselves right in the foot or something or in the eye. You know, it's like, call the, call the ambulance. But anyways, the point is, when something interesting or significant happens in your life, you want to tell people. Okay, you should tell certain people about certain things. Well, don't leave God out of those things. You say, well, he already knows. He knew before you were going to have a baby. He knew, he knew you before you guys knew that you were going to have a baby, right? Yes, that's true, but I'm just pointing out the type of stuff that Jesus talked about in his prayer was, was the big significant thing going on. And he shared his feelings and his heart about it, and that's a good exercise to do with God. Don't leave God out of the significant things that happen in your life. That's number two. Look at verse three. And this is life eternal that they might know thee, the only true God, and Jesus Christ, whom thou hast sent. So Jesus here just says, let's define for all precisely what true eternal life is. It's to know you, Father, and it's to know me, Jesus Christ. Knowing God is life more abundant. It's the, it's the life more abundantly that Jesus talked about. And if you, if you don't know God that well, you've just never really gotten into walking with God. You never, don't really have a great grasp on the God of the Scriptures. Folks, what this is saying, in the, sense, the scripture is essentially saying, you haven't lived. That, like, that's how we would say it in our modern vernacular. It's just, man, what, what, is, what is your life all about? Get to know God. If you haven't tasted life like it was intended to, what are you waiting for? Get, make time to know God. Make time to get to a place, find a spot outdoors, find a field, find a spot indoors, find a closet, a private space somewhere, find a wooded area, find a garden. Get to know God. Take his word, obviously. Get to know his words. Watch how his word reveals to you his true character and his true nature. Obviously, we don't want to start falling for you know, how many of the false gods are out there, the false fake gods that people have created in their own image. You don't want to start falling for that. It's the God of the Bible, the God revealed in his written word. That's his nature. But Jesus said, look, that's true life eternal, and I know that to know you is to have real life. And so that's something we always want to think about when we're talking about prayer. Verse number four. I have glorified thee on the earth. I have finished the work which thou gavest me to do. I mentioned this once. This is a terrific prayer promise. If you actually go through your life, you know, a good portion of your life, and you're able to look back and say, you know what, God, you called me to do something, and I've done it. I've finished that work. I've accomplished what you called me to accomplish. Listen, that is a great way to have your prayer answered. Like, you can go ask any God for anything at that point, right? Now, of course, anybody can ask God for anything. That's within the will of God and the spirit of God. We talked a lot about that as well. But that, that, I'm saying that if you want your prayers answered, that's something you need. You need to find the will of God. You need to do it. Verse number uh, five. And now, O Father, glorify thou me with thine own self, with the glory which I had with thee before the world was. When I wrote down here in number three, I said com be completely open and honest with God or simply acknowledge your past. Don't ignore your past. 
Don't pretend your past isn't there or just reject your past or try to forget about it. Now, obviously, in our example here, Jesus is perfect. This has always been perfect. He's been God forever. But the point is, for everybody, our past is a big picture. It's, it's part of the big picture of our relationship with God. That's a lot what, what prayer is, our relationship with God. And so you can never just pretend that your prayer didn't happen, that your, that your past didn't happen. You can never just pretend that your past doesn't matter. What happened in your past is part of you, and all of you needs to go to God to have the communion with God when you pray. You have to acknowledge it and deal with it. Obviously, if there's a sinful past that you have, you get forgiveness for it one time. You don't have to keep asking for forgiveness over and over again for the same sin. We talked about that before. But whatever happens in your prayers every day, your past is part of it. You say, what if I have a sinful past? Remember, Jesus, um, he gave a parable once about a man who had two debtors. He says, the one with 50 pence and the other one with 500. And Jesus just said, when they were both forgiven, who loved and who appreciated the forgiveness more? Now, let me say this, that that in no wise should be disparaging to somebody with fewer sins in their past. If you have a relatively clean past, you should be thankful for that. You should be very, very thankful for that. But whether you've got a very, very sinful past or a not so sinful past, that becomes part of your story and who you are. And the Bible says they that worship God must worship him in spirit and in truth. Obviously, worshiping him in spirit, you know, we, we don't use physical means to do it. We use our spirit, and our spirit has to be alive. We use the Bible, and we've talked about that probably some other time. But in truth in that verse is also saying you cannot put on a facade with God. You cannot put on a mask. You cannot be fake. You have to be who you are. You have to be real. That's what verse 5 is basically all about. Jesus is just being who he is. You think about the Apostle Paul. He eventually developed a terrific relationship with the Lord. But the Bible talks about how he was a blasphemer and a persecutor and injurious. That's how he put it. But he said, I obtained mercy because I did it ignorantly in unbelief. And that dynamic of gratitude remained there the rest of his life. And it was a source of affection for him, for the Lord. He loved God and he appreciated so much the forgiveness of God in his life. And so that was an important part of the connection, the relationship he had with God. He loved the Lord much because he was forgiven much. It's just like we saw a couple weeks ago, maybe last week, with the, the situation where Jacob went down and started wrestling by the, by the river, with, uh, by the river with the, uh, with the angel. The angel says, what is thy name? Remember, and he said completely honest, look, my name is Jacob. Basically what he's saying is, yeah, I'm, a, I'm a supplanter, I'm a trickster, okay? And many, many points in my life, I've been pretty deceitful with the people around me, even my family. And the angel said, okay, good. Now we're being completely honest and open with God, and now we can make progress. We have the mutual respect. You've wrestled with God and you've prevailed, as we talked about. Now you can be prince with God. But an important part of that was being completely open and honest when asked, who are you, Jacob? What is your name? So if we follow the example of Christ in verse 5, we always take into account everything that we are before God, before we pray. We don't try to pretend bad things didn't happen. We don't try to... It's sort of like a, a, we might try to do in church. You might try to fake spirituality a little bit so that, that maybe that'll help you to start being real about it. They used to preach that at the Baptist church I used to go to. They used to say it over and over again. They said this. They just fake it till you fill it or fake it till you make it. Who's ever heard something like that? Fake it till you make it. Okay? A couple nods. Couple Most of you are like, no, that sounds terrible. And I, I think that is terrible. I, I, I think I disagree with it. Don't fake it. Don't be fake. Be real with me and the other Christians around you about things that they can sharpen your confidence on. Be real about, hey, I, I need to work on my reading, Bible reading. Hey, I need to work on my prayer. Okay, then I can help you with that if you're real about it. But if you're fake, I can't, right? But what, even worse, though, if you start learning how to be fake with other people, you might take that to the prayer closet. You might take that to your walk with God, and, and intentionally or unintentionally, but that will destroy your walk with God. You cannot take a fake attitude. You cannot take the facade of the mask to your walk with God in your prayer closet. God wants openness. Jesus Christ is basically saying, all throughout eternity past, I've had this relationship with you. I've had this love for you. The relationship that we had is greater than any other two people have ever loved each other. Obviously, God is a person, amen? But that part of that, that dynamic now is being called to bear in his prayer. 
He's going to pray later for the disciples to have certain great blessings and spiritual things happen to them. And he takes into account, God, Father, I want you to take into account, I've been with you for how long now? Eternity. You can't even measure how long it's been. And that relationship that we have. Does that make sense? That has to be part of the dynamic. So the things in your past have to be part of that dynamic. Now, God has removed your sins as far as east is from the west. That isn't what I'm talking about. Not sin. I'm talking about just who you are. What's your life, your personality, what the things you like. Don't try to pretend with God that you like something that you just think is spiritual for everybody to like and you really don't care about. It. Be real with God. Number six, uh, verse number six, I have manifested, he said, to manifest, to display, or show, or demonstrate. I have manifested thy name unto the men which thou gavest me out of the world. Thine they were, and thou gavest them me, and they have kept thy word. Jesus has some spiritual work that he has accomplished, and now he talks about that in prayer. Again, that will enhance your walk with God. When you have been faithful reading the word of God, when you've been faithful in prayer, and you've been faithful preaching the gospel, and fasting, and other things like that, spiritual activity, those things help you mature in prayer as well. Verse 7, now they have known that all things whatsoever thou hast given me are of thee. They know that the things I gave them aren't necessarily just for me. They're for you, God. Again, Jesus is not out for his own glory. He's out there to glorify the Father. Verse 8, For I have given unto them the words which thou gavest me, and they have received them, and have known surely that I came out from thee, and they have believed that thou didst send me. Again, preaching the gospel, encouraging people through the principles of the word of God, other spiritual exercise. It's giving Jesus things that he can use to relate with, things that he can use for building that ability to pray. You cannot be the prayer warrior, that's the, the, you cannot reach your potential as a prayer warrior until you are following the principles of the Word of God, doing those other spiritual exercise things, reading your Bible and uh, being a benefit to others in some way, encouraging people. Verse number nine, I pray for them, I pray not for the world. I find that interesting. It sounds like Jesus didn't do a lot of praying for lost people to be saved. He prayed for more laborers in the harvest. And that's what we need to work toward and pray for. I can't make somebody get saved. Amen? But I can pray that the Lord will send more laborers into his harvest. And I can preach, but I can set up a, a program at the church, and I can be involved in programs and, and, and be a part, even financially or some other way, be a part of programs that are working toward getting more and more young men and more and more young ladies to surrender the ministry, to do something for God with their life. More and more young men who take the word of God, they grab their King James Bible, they master it, they know it, say, hey, I'm going to be a preacher, I'm going to join, I'm going to help out, I'm going to be a laborer for God. Hey, that is something that we can tangibly work for. Obviously, we work for trying to get people saved, but we can't make people get saved. And so Jesus said, you know what? I pray, I, I want you guys to pray that the Lord would send more laborers into his harvest. I pray not for the world, but for them which thou hast given me, for they are thine, and all mine are thine, and thine are mine, and I am glorified in them. So when we pray for others, we pray for Christians, obviously, with the right mindset. I think it's sort of like you would talk to the Father of the person you're praying for. I made that number four here. Pray for others in a way, sort of like you would speak to the Father of the person for whom you're praying, if that makes sense. Because if we're not careful, we tend to think of ourselves as much closer to the people that we're talking about than God is. I mean, I can shake your hand after church tonight. I can give you a big bear hug. But we can't necessarily feel that close to God all the time. But obviously, the people in this room, you belong to God. You don't really belong to me in any way. We don't necessarily belong to each other in the sense in which you belong to God. God made you. He, birthed, he brought you into existence. And so... You are a million, I think God is a million times closer to you than maybe I could ever be. And God knows you a million times better than I can ever possibly know you. And so that's how we talk to God as, as somebody, he's from the, the, this other person. I'm praying for somebody in the church. I'm praying for another Christian across the nation. Hey, you know this person a million times better than I do. And so that's how we can pray for them. Jesus just says here, one of the reasons why. He's praying for the disciples is the fact that they're God's. They're God's children. They belong to God. And therefore, God had an interest in working on their behalf. He's playing into that. Verse 11. And now I am no more in the world, but these are in the world, and I come to thee. Holy Father, keep to thine own name those whom thou hast given me, that they may be one as we are. 
I think this again falls into that cat first category. No elephants in the room. There's a big change that's about to take place here. I'm going to come to you. I'm going to sit down at the right hand of the Father, and I'm going to be the mediator between God and man. They're going to need protection. My presence will be taken from them. They're going to need divine help and unity. They're going to need to be in one accord. And of course, Jesus talked in the pre previous chapter, chapter 16, about how when Jesus does go and sit at the right hand of the Father, what happens? The comforter comes. So that's a different sermon. But right here, we're talking about the protection they're going to need. Jesus, the God, God the Father is being prayed to by Jesus Christ. Please help him with unity. Number six is unity. Number six, unity. Listen, you can't have a good prayer life unless you're right with your earthly authorities. And look, we find unity really when we rally around the truth of God's word. That's the only way unity is really a virtue. We're going to see it's vitally important to Jesus in this chapter. Unity is mentioned over and over again. It's probably one of the top three things Jesus prays for. The unity of saved people. The unity of his followers. Verse 12. While I was with them in the world, I kept them in thy name. Those that thou gavest me, I have kept, and none of them is lost but the son of perdition, that the scripture might be fulfilled. So he kept them. He's been protecting them. He'll keep protecting them here in the next chapter as they come with swords and spears to apprehend him. He'll go out of his way to protect them from harm. So he says, now, Father, look, I'm coming home. They're going to need protection. And that's another thing that it's good for us to pray for, for others, for God to protect them. Verse 13, and now am I to thee, and these things I speak in the world that they might have my joy fulfilled in themselves. So it sounds like we can have something to do with how much joy Jesus has. That's what's being said here. It's something, uh, I think most of us probably know that, you know, if you really asked yet. But that's something that we should let sink in. That should blow you away to some extent. You can help Jesus have joy. Or you can cause him to have disappointment. It's up to us, based upon the way we live our lives. Verse 14, I have given them thy word, and the world hath hated to them, because they are not of the world, even as I am not of the world. He says this again in verse 16. They are not of the world, even as I am not of the world. So he, he doubles it twice. It's really, really important that he's getting this across. He mentions the protection. Again, remember we mentioned the protection because people are going to hate the true followers of Jesus Christ. Paul said, yea, and all who live godly in Christ Jesus shall suffer persecution. Jesus said, if the world hate you, ye know that it hated me before it hated you. If they have persecuted me, they will persecute you also. The servant is not greater than his Lord. And what he's saying when he says that the servant is not greater than his Lord is basically, if I came to the earth and I was sinless and I was perfect and I did my best, you know I like to get along with people, but I stood up for truth, number one. That was my priority. So you can't say, well, I'm going to stand up for truth. I am going to just be a bulwark for the truth of the gospel and righteousness, but I think I can also get along with everybody. I can get along with the mayor and the chief of police. I'm a, I think I can get along with the, whoever the sinful people are in town. I'm a, nobody's going to hate me or dislike me. I think I can do both. Jesus says, no, you can't. He says, because I couldn't do that. You think you're smarter than me? The servant is not greater than his Lord. And so that's why, G, that's why Paul said, listen, yea, and all that will live God in Christ Jesus shall suffer persecution. And so the hatred Jesus knew was coming toward his disciples. He's got to pray to the Father now to help protect there's, there's going to be hatred on these people. I've come to bring a sword, Jesus talked about, right? We're going about that and rabbit trails, but the point is that that's the, the reason why this is here. He's asking for protection from God because these people are going to hate. We're, we're, we're just about to go to the cross ourselves. Jesus is just about to die on the cross, and he knows what's going to happen to Stephen. He probably knew that. He knew what was going to happen to James later on. He probably knew that, that James was going to be executed too. Look at verse 15. I pray not that thou shouldest take them out of the world, but that thou shouldest keep them from the evil. And this is a biblical principle. We're in the world. We don't believe that God wants for us to set up some kind of a commune, you know, to create um, uh, a, you know, just a, a place where just nobody get, comes in. It's just, just somewhere for us and our children just have no contact with the world, and we just meditate and fast and pray and, and get holier and holier, and then we die having influence versus no one. That's not New Testament Christianity. Paul said in 1 Corinthians 5, I wrote unto you in an epistle not to company with fornicators, yet not altogether with the fornicators of this world, or with the covetous or extortioners or with idolaters, for then must ye needs go out of the world. He says, look, if you sincerely attempt, you know, to attempt, if you were to sincerely attempt 
That level of separation from unsaved sinful people, you just have to go to some commune or die or something like that. It's not reality. So we separate ourselves from the evil in areas which we can control. We abstain from evil and sin. We keep our minds and our hearts clean. And then we pray to God and ask the Lord that we should not be led into temptation. We do all we can with the things in our control. And we pray and trust God to care for the things that are out of our control. But we shouldn't be in a commune. We, 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 we need to be out in the community keeping the Great Commission. So it's much better for us to be protected from evil and triumph over evil and to continue to fulfill the Great Commission in the, mind, in the midst of a crooked and perverse generation among whom you shine as lights of the world than it is for simply to be held back from evil, kept away from evil in some kind of conduit or something. Verse number 16. They are not of the world, even as I am not of the world. Sanctify them through thy truth. Thy word is true. And here we see an important part in our effort to stay clean from sin. We must know, we must have a lot of exposure to the word of God. Wherewithal shall the young man cleanse his way? By taking heed thereto according to the, thy word, the Bible says. I love how my wife many times in the mornings will have her Bible program playing. It's just playing in the house. We can listen to the word of God as we're going about some of the breakfast and some of the morning things that we do. I'll flip it on, turn mine on sometimes. Just get the word of God coming in to your brain and into your mind. The better you know God's word, the more likely you'll keep yourself holy and set apart to be pleasing to the Lord. Verse 18. As thou hast sent me into the world, even so have I sent them into the world. You know, let me just say this real quick. This is a really, really simple prayer. Most of the things he's praying about, they're pretty simple. They're right there on the surface to some extent. Keep your prayers simple. When you're talking to God, I mean, this is God in the flesh in this chapter, speaking to God the Father in heaven. This Father could literally understand anything that Jesus could possibly have talked about. If he had talked about trigonometry and calculus, if he had talked about, you know, complicated physics and string theory and quantum mechanics, you know, he, he would have completely understood it all, right? If he had spoken about all mysteries and all knowledge and spiritual things like Paul talked about, the Father would have comprehended the deepest of concepts and mysteries, but is Jesus really getting there? He's not. He's just, it's very, very simple. You and I can read this and understand most of everything that's going on. So in, in our, I think in our prayer life, that's, you know, be yourself. Obviously, you're never going to impress God at some of the deep, heavy stuff that you can understand. Just, just whatever level that you normally communicate with other adults. You know, sometimes you have to try to relate to kids a bit of a different level than adults. I remember when I first moved here, I, mean, I, I didn't know Bill Martin too well. And uh, people would talk to me about it. They said, oh, he was so great in junior church. He's just a big kid. You know, and it's got other things about how he's, you know, kind of has this juvenile attitude or something like that. And so we, we went out soul winning and we went, we, we did other things and interacted together. And I'm like, this guy's a perfectly normal adult human being, you know, like, what in the world is he talking about? But it, watch him sometime in BBS, you know, I mean, he just puts on the headdress and, you know, loses himself. That's what you got to do with kids, right? You can't be too stoic and stuffed up. And, you know, it's, it's, uh, it's, it's, it's difficult learning, you know, the, 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 uh, the balance and all of that. But I, I'm just saying, yeah, sometimes you gotta bring yourself down to a kid in order to relate to them and build your relationship with kids. And some of the things that I say sometimes, well, once in a while, I use the term naughty in the pulpit. My wife was like, I can tell you have five kids at this age, right? Because naughty is not a normal adult number word, right? But um, I'm just saying, yeah, sometimes you gotta get to a kid's level and you gotta help them you know, be able to communicate with you and you're building that relationship with them. And now, then you move over and you talk to the grown-ups, the adults, right? How do you talk to them? That's the same exactly you need to talk to God. You don't need to talk to God as a, Oh, Father, the God of Abraham, and the God of Isaac, and the God of Jacob, thou which dwellest between the cherubims and weird stuff like that. God, the God's not impressed with any of that stuff, obviously. And that kind of goes without saying, but I mean, that, that's what I see in this chapter is Jesus is pretty simple. He's praying, he's praying about concepts that are right here with us to understand. Remember, you gotta worship God in truth. You gotta be yourself, amen? Look at verse 8, 19. And for their sakes, I sanctify myself that they also might be sanctified through the truth. I think this could apply to somebody, maybe if you're a leader, okay? Like I'm a pastor. I try to pray for the people of the church, of course. Here, Jesus is the leader. And in another place, he, he said, remember, the servant is not greater than his master or, or teacher. Jesus is our example as a leader. And as a leader, we need to keep ourselves sanctified and pure and holy. Because to some extent, our followers will generally not be more sanctified than we are. So the main reason I bring that out is just to apply it again to prayer. We see 
that our actions affect our prayers. If we live righteously and we keep ourselves from sin, then we can pray and ask the Lord to help us and to help our followers stay clean from sin. If we're not keeping ourselves clean from sin, that's going to hinder our prayer. And it's going to hinder our followers from being the, the from reaching their potential as well. Verse 20, neither pray I for these alone, but for them also which shall believe on me through their word. I love this verse. Now he's going to pray about us, essentially. People who have gotten saved because of the word and the testimony of the apostles and the followers of Christ. We didn't see Jesus with our own two eyes. We heard the words that were being spoken to us out of the word of God and out of the testimony of those great men. Let's see how Christ prays for us. Verse 21, that they all may be one. See how that's just high on his priority list? I want to see unity. I don't want to see my children fighting with each other, fussing with each other, constantly being at odds. I want them to be one. As thou, Father, art in me, and I in thee. That is the, the highest example you can have. I mean, like, can you imagine God the Father just like arguing with Jesus? Like, no, you're stupid. What are you talking about? No, you just, that, that's just blasphemy. Oh, what in the world is that, right? Jesus Christ and God the Father are so at one. And he said, I want that. I mean, talk about big prayers. I want my followers at that same level of oneness. Wow. I mean, that's just big. <laughs> Shoot. How in the world can you pray for somebody like that? And you look around the world today, and it's hard to say, was that prayer not answered? Do you, do you know what I'm trying to say? It's just like, I don't know if I want to make that declaration, you know, because of the fact that we have 1,600 different just Protestant religions in, our, in, in America alone, I think, is how many they have. We, we've splintered so much, and again, we, we have to have a balance. I have to stand up strong for, you know, for judgment. Judgment must begin in the house of the Lord. I have to make sure that our, our, our priorities are straight, make sure our doctrines are straight and sometimes there is a right time to separate but at the end of the day love by this shall all men know that you are my disciples you have love one for another scriptures make reference to similar themes to the mind-boggling nature of the fact that we are expected to have that same level of oneness with god and then if we do look what it talks about later on many times in other scriptures if we suffer with him we shall also reign with him the Bible says we're heirs of God and joint heirs with Christ. Salvation has so many benefits that we have yet to grasp fully in our physical minds and our physical flesh. And we need to decide to behave ourselves and conduct ourselves worthy of that. And that's part of what that oneness is. I, I, let me tell you the level of oneness I want you to go to. It's like, it's like when he said, husbands, love your wives as Christ loved the church. Whew, that is tough to obey that every single day, day in and day out. But that's what he expects. Why? Because he's going to give us the benefits. We're going to reign with him. He's going to give us that you're going to be heirs with God and join heirs with Christ. He expects us to conduct ourselves worthily of that. So Jesus is praying for unity among his followers, something that we may not necessarily have down. Because I don't think for a second that the only saved people in the whole world are independent fundamental Baptists. And y'all know me, I'm all about separation where the issues are over which we need to have separation. But I feel like there needs to be a balance. The main thing in a local church is that we have unity. We don't have the schisms. We don't have cliques. We don't have, I am a Paul and I'm a Cephas and I'm a, I'm a Peter and I'm, a, and I'm a, a Paul and I'm a Christ. Now, if our minds were not blown on that verse, verse 22 may be even more amazing. And the glory which thou gavest me, I have given them, that they may be one as you, even as we are one. So if you're sitting there overwhelmed by, hold on, the oneness that I have to have, preacher, is actually the same oneness of Jesus Christ and God the Father and himself together. Jesus has enabled that. He said, I gave them the glory which thou hast given me. Think about the glory which God the Father had with Jesus Christ before the world was. Think about, you know, go to the New Jerusalem in your mind in Revelation chapter 21. We see the very foundation itself etched with the names of the 12 apostles. So God is giving great glory to them. It's like, hold on a second, preacher. You said a long time ago, we're not supposed to pray in such a way that brings glory to us. No, but God will be raising up and giving glory to those who are worthy of the great crowns and the great rewards one day because he decides who is worthy. It's not that we are to pray in such a way that we get that, that stuff to ourselves, that we get that glory to ourselves. But God has a great amount of glory that he is going to be giving to those people who earn it with the sacrifice and the labor for Christ. 
those who stay patient in tribulation, those who stay patient through the persecutions that are going to come, no doubt, for those that will live godly in Christ Jesus. You can't outgive God. God will greatly reward those who live godly in Christ Jesus. Verse 23. I in them and thou in me, that they may be per made perfect in one, and that the world may know that thou hast sent me and hast loved them as thou hast loved me. So Jesus is envisioning here the right way for the world to recognize that he is the true Messiah, that he came from God. As he mentioned in chapter 13, he says here, he, that will come from Christians maturing and becoming complete. Christians becoming the whole package. Everybody else seeing that unity among the Christians and seeing that maturation among the Christians, that is what is going to show the world that Jesus Christ was the true Messiah. Now, of course, if people will still want to reject Jesus Christ, they will. They've got to deal with that between them and God. But Christ's plan for being the testimony they cannot deny is for Christians to be mature and to become well-rounded Christians and to be one accord with other Christians. So spiritual growth is not a pie-in-the-sky Hopes, hope for type of a thing. The fact that you should know the Bible better than you did last year. The fact that your prayer life should be stronger today than it is last than it was last year. The fact that your witness for Christ should be stronger than it has been in your past. Those things are not some kind of a well. I hope that that's the case. I may, maybe that should be the case. That is Jesus' hope for making the world know that He really is the true Messiah. The fact that they can look at your life and see the Holy Spirit working like that. Look at verse 24. Father, I will that they also whom thou hast given me be with me where I am. Now I think this might be similar to Jesus' statement in John 3, 13. The Son of Man which is in heaven, present tense. Speaking of those things which be now, those other words you've mentioned. I desire the day, he says. I desire the day when I see my disciples and followers in heaven. That's likely just natural for him to desire as he's preparing himself to go to the cross. That has to be in his mind. That they may behold my glory which thou hast given me. For thou lovest me before the foundation of the world. Jesus looks forward to the time that he can show his followers his glory. And we look forward to that day with great longing as the Apostle John put it in 1 John. But we know that when he shall appear, we shall be like him, for we shall see him as he is, he said. What a great hope that is for us. We know that it shall be so one day. We know that by faith. It's in the word of God. O righteous Father, verse 25. The world hath not known thee, but I have known thee, and these have known that thou hast sent me. He's sort of bringing out a contrast here between the world and his followers. Basically, he's praising his followers for their faith. You might remember in the letters to the churches in Revelation 2 and 3, in virtually every letter, Jesus expresses, listen, I know thy works. And Jesus himself personally notices all the work that you do. He sees your sincerity. He sees your effort. He sees your works. None of your works for Christ go unnoticed. Not one. He said, even said once something as little as getting somebody else a drink of water. In the name of Christ, that is noticed. It is not forgotten. Jesus here praises the virtue of his followers to God the Father. It's very encouraging if we've been doing works for Christ, which every Christian should be doing. In verse 26, and I have declared unto them thy name, and will declare it, that the love wherewith thou hast loved me may be in them, and I in them. He prays, Lord, give them the same love, the same caliber love wherewith you loved me before anything else was created. Again, I see that oneness that he's wanting, the same oneness as between him and the Father. And then he says right here, how about the love too, God? Can you do that too? Can you provide a love between them? And can you provide a love from them to me and from me to them that is the same caliber love that you and I enjoyed before the foundation of the world? The love of the Father and the Son, particularly the love of God the Father and God the Son. It's the purest and deepest love of all. And Jesus prays for God the Father to continue in that same love with us and for us all. Jesus prayed some big prayers. But here, apparently this is a prayer that's entirely possible. And I don't know that I can think of anything greater, really, than this prayer should be answered and come to pass in eternity. What a great day that will be. So what do we look at tonight? The example of Christ in prayer. We said, first off, all prayers need to be to the end of the glory of God the Father. We said, number two, when we pray, we should talk about and acknowledge the main things going on in our life. Number three, we said that in prayer, we should be completely open and honest with God or simply acknowledge your past. It's a part of you. Don't ignore it and don't pretend it's not there. Number four, we said, pray about others. Pray for others about like you would speak to the Father 
of the person for whom you're praying. And number five was just unity. As much as lieth in us, we should let the world see Christians getting along. We should be being examples of what it means to love one another. That is the dream and the prayer of Christ. Even if we disagree, even if we don't feel right about teaming up on an endeavor or whatever, we can still love one another. We can still show the love of Christ to other believers. Let's have a word of prayer. Our Father, we're thankful for this uh, amazing chapter. We're not going to have an invitation tonight. I'm going to go ahead and dismiss. But Lord, I, I appreciate so much us going through these subjects in prayer, these thoughts in prayer. I hope that the people have been encouraged to be faithful to their prayer time, to their prayer closet, to their prayer life. Lord, I just pray that we would not be a church uh, with people who have a two-bit prayer life. I pray that we have to be a church of people who understand prayer and who actually pray and who are faithful to prayer. People who have the ability to reach out to heaven itself. People who have the ability to get a hold of God. And I pray that this church, because of that ability, one day, 30 years, 40 years, 50 years down the road, will look at the things which you've done. Not the things which we have done. The things which you have done through us. The things that you have done right here in New Hockey, The things that you have done in Southeast Ohio. The things that you have done in Decatur. And we would glorify you for the great works that have been done. Because we could never do them without you. Lord, we love you. We pray that you make us so. Make us the prayer warriors that you desire for us to be for our good. That you desire for us to receive those rewards. You desire for us to see others who, 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 whose lives have been affected, whose lives have been better, because we knew how to get in a prayer closet and get something from God. I pray that that would be the case, Lord, in Jesus' name. Amen. Thank you for being here tonight. You are dismissed. I appreciate it very much. Thank you.